What is going on guys and happy 2018. I'm really excited to be doing my first video of the year, which is going to be an academic focused video. I am here with a really interesting topic that a lot of people ask me consistently is the question of whether or not artificial sweeteners are safe. Understandably so, a lot of people have concerns regarding artificial sweeteners. The word artificial in itself doesn't really sound very appetizing and the fact that they are man-made compounds seems to make people feel a little bit weary about them. However, they are a way for us to get in that sweet tastes that we all love without all the added calories. But do the benefits of enjoying low calorie sweets and zero calorie sodas outweigh the harm? Artificial sweeteners have become a staple in the industry of food production and has seeped its way into thousands of foods that we see in the grocery store every single day. And they come by a few different aliases, uh, sometimes known as non-nutritive sweeteners, non-caloric sweeteners, as well as non-caloric high intensity sweeteners, which probably come comes from their ability to sweeten foods 200 to 600 times that of sugar. For the scope of this video, as well as the length, I am only going to be covering the most frequently used artificial sweeteners. There is a lot to go over, so I do apologize if I occasionally look down to look at my notes, and there will be timestamps in the description box if you want to jump around. This will be an unbiased review of the current literature as it stands to date, which is January 2018, and I'm aware that there's always ongoing research that will come to light. However, I took a systematic review and meta-analysis approach, and I know that there are a lot of uncertainties surrounding the world of artificial sweeteners, as the media is constantly sensationalizing headlines that artificial sweeteners are carcinogenic, they cause type 2 diabetes, they cause weight gain, and can cause disruption to the microbiome. So I think this is a really important topic to discuss with my health-conscious audience. And although these are all lumped into basically one category, the molecular makeup of artificial sweeteners can vary immensely. And to start, I think it's really important to note how regulatory agencies and food safety administrations define what is safe to consume. And you might have heard of the acronym before, ADI, which is Acceptable Daily Intake, which is defined as the maximum amount of a chemical that can be ingested daily over a lifetime with no appreciable health risk and is based on the highest intake that does not give rise to observable adverse effects. So it's basically the amount that you can have every single day of your life with nothing bad happening to you. And then the way that they get this number is it starts off at a significantly higher number, and this number is called the no adverse effect level, and this number was originally derived from experimental studies. And then they further divide that by a safety factor, which is oftentimes a 100-fold or even more to get that ADI. This makes the ADI magnitudes less of what has already been shown to be safe. And this approach has been used by the FDA and food regulatory agencies for decades and has been proven to be reliably protective. And today in this video, these are the artificial sweeteners that I will be going over, and these are the listed ADI for each of those. So first up on my list of artificial sweeteners is one that you've all probably heard of, which is aspartame. It's roughly 200 times the sweetness of sugar and is the most commonly used artificial sweetener in the world, and probably one of the most well studied. Approved by the FDA in 1981, it is found in more than 6,000 products, and about 2 million people around the world consume it regularly. And aspartame got a pretty bad rap after a 1996 landmark observational study that noted that there was a rise in brain tumors in the population. They were exploring to see whether or not there was a link between the introduction of aspartame on the market and the rise of brain tumors. With the media covering this and sensationalizing the headline, a lot of people had in their minds that aspartame caused brain tumors. However, with further epidemiological and statistical studies, they found that there was a rise in brain tumors in a population that was aged over 70. At that time, most people in that age group were not really known for consuming a lot of diet soda. And the National Cancer Institute also noted that there was a rise in brain tumors starting from 1973, which was well before aspartame was approved by the FDA. The American Cancer Society also notes no link between aspartame and increases in cancer after studies with more than 500,000 people showing no association between aspartame and an increase in cancer. However, this association seemed to have struck a chord in a lot of people's memories and a lot of people don't forget it. And some of the more recent concerns that have come from aspartame are due to its broken down constituents. And aspartame is broken down into three different metabolites, which is methanol, 
phenylalanine and aspartic acid. Methanol has been stirring up the most concern because methanol in the body is then later converted into formaldehyde. However, there is no evidence that this conversion results in any harmful levels of formaldehyde in the body. This is due to the fact that the amount of methanol that you get from aspartame is very, very small. To give you some context, there's more methanol in fruits and vegetables than in a can of diet soda. And for example, there's six times more methanol in a glass of tomato juice than in a 12 ounce can of diet soda. Therefore, the amount of methanol and thus formaldehyde produced is very insignificant and doesn't cause any harm. Your body also produces formaldehyde just on its own and at levels thousands of times higher with no harmful effects. And aside from methanol, the other metabolites, aspartic acid and phenylalanine, are actually just amino acids. These amino acids are found in foods that we eat every single day, and there's no harm in eating them. However, there is one population that should be more mindful of the amount of aspartame that they are consuming. These are people with a rare genetic disorder called phenylketonuria, or PKU. And like I said, this is a rare genetic disorder that causes an increase in phenylalanine in the blood to sometimes harmful levels. Therefore, I think that people with this disorder should be more mindful of their aspartame consumption. Otherwise, studies show that there's no evidence to fear consumption of aspartame, and studies show that normal adults, adolescents, and children are perfectly safe to consume aspartame. And the ADI that I mentioned earlier, or the acceptable daily intake for aspartame is 50 milligrams per kilogram per day. And in a person that weighs roughly 80 kilos or 160 pounds. This translates to about 21 cans of diet soda a day, every single day for the rest of your life with no appreciable health risks. Next up is sucralose, which is another widely used non-nutritive sweetener, which you may know as Splenda. Approved by the FDA in 1999, it is approximately 600 times the sweetness of sugar. And unlike aspartame, extensive studies show that sucralose does not further break down into metabolites. And sucralose, along with its other artificial sweetener constituents, have been given a bad stigma when it comes to compromising insulin sensitivity. There have been some recent studies in in vitro cell lines, so in vitro meaning not in an animal or human model, showing that artificial sweeteners can stimulate intestinal and teroendocrine cells to release glucagon-like peptide 1 and glucose-dependent insulinotropic peptide, which are hormones typically released in the colon after food consumption. So this has led to the thought that artificial sweeteners can cause a release of insulin. However, no human trials show insulin secretion or changes in utilization of glucose after sucralose or Splenda consumption. Other parameters that were measured found that there is no carcinogenic properties, no effects on the human function, reproductive and development function, gastric emptying, appetite, or levels of ghrelin. And this was not only found in healthy individuals, but they found this after treatment of sucralose in also type 2 diabetics. And the established ADI for sucralose is 5 milligrams per kilogram a day which is 31 packets of Splenda a day, every single day. Next up is a sulfame potassium, or ACE-K. And ACE-K was approved by the FDA in 1988 and is approximately 200 times the sweetness of sugar. It is often found in food in combination with either aspartame or sucralose. ACE-K in foods is actually very stable and is frequently used in foods that need to be cooked because ACE-K can retain sweetness even at higher temperatures. And unlike sucralose, 100% of ACE-K is absorbed, but it's not metabolic. Once ingested, it is quickly absorbed into the systemic circulation and then distributed to the tissue. Then it is filtered out by the kidney and excreted primarily in urine. And a major concern derived from the use of ACE-K has come about pretty recently. There's been a recent paper that came out just last year in 2017 out of a collaborative effort of UNC and the University of Georgia that showed changes in the gut microbiota as a result of consuming ACE-K. This study was done in mice and the mice were dosed with 37 7.5 milligrams per kilogram per day for four weeks, which I'd like to note is significantly more than double the recommended ADI for ASK. In addition to changes in the gut microbiota, they also observed weight gain in male mice only. So not in female mice, but just in male mice. However, there's a few things that I'd like to bring to your attention about this study. And don't get me wrong, I think that studies concerning the gut microbiota are incredibly interesting and I fully understand the importance of the microbiome. However, they did use an extremely high dose in these mice, not really realistic to the amount that a human would be consuming, as well as they had a very small N or number of mice in the study. So in each group, there were only five male mice and then five female mice. And as we know, studies done in mice don't always translate very well to humans. However,
However, I would be very open to seeing further research on this topic as well as any human trials. But at the moment, I'm a little bit skeptical of this study. But with all of that being said, more than 90 studies have demonstrated the safety of ACE-K use. ACE-K is currently in use in over 4,000 food and beverages in over 90 countries around the world. The established ADI for ACE-K is 15 milligrams per kilogram per day, which actually translates to about 30 to 32 cans of diet soda every single day. Next, I have to at least mention a non-nutritive sweetener called saccharin. Saccharin is probably the oldest of the bunch and its use dates back all the way to 1900. However, saccharin is not very commonly used in food and beverages at this moment, but since you've probably seen those pink sweet and low packets on the table of your favorite breakfast joint, I thought it was at least important to mention it. It has been extensively studied for use and consumption in the US and has been approved by the FDA, the JECFA, and the scientific committee. It is about 300 100 times the sweetness of sugar and its established ADI is 5 milligrams per kilogram per day and this translates to 9 to 12 sweet and low packets every single day. But again, I just wanted to briefly mention it because it's not really commonly found in food and beverages and a lot of different countries in the world don't even use it. And the last one on our list of the non-nutritive sweeteners is stevia or stevia leaf extract. And this is a newly introduced natural zero calorie sweetener on the market, which has been given a very positive association in a lot of people's minds because it is natural or derived from nature. But I just want to make a very quick disclaimer that just because something is derived from nature doesn't mean that it's good for you you or that it's better than something that's been synthesized in the lab. Compounds are compounds. I always like to use the example that apple seeds contain cyanide, but cyanide can also kill you. And stevia was a little bit tricky to investigate because it's a little bit more indirect than other sweeteners. So stevia is isolated stevia extract and is made of one or more sweet tasting compounds called steviol glycosides, which are about 200 times the sweetness of sugar. There are multiple steviol glycosides that are converted into steviol in the colon. In the colon, Steviol is then absorbed and then later excreted primarily in the feces. And after initially being banned in the United States in 1991 due to there being gaps in the required safety information, but once appropriate safety, metabolism, and clinical studies were conducted and made public in 2008, purified steviol glycosides, also known as steviocides, were given full ADI approval by the FDA. And due to its recent emergence, the safety of steviol glycosides does not have the history and research that a lot of the other non-nutritive sweeteners has, but it has been appropriately reviewed in the literature and has been deemed safe for consumption, displaying no genotoxic or carcinogenic effects. The established ADI for steviol is four milligrams per kilogram a day, which actually translates to 40 packets of stevia a day, every single day. And now that I've covered each individual non-nutritive sweetener that is commonly found on the market, I wanted to touch on a topic that all non-nutritive sweeteners have been guilty of. And that is the association of weight gain that a lot of correlative studies have argued that non-nutritive sweeteners actually causes an increase in appetite. And this seems to be a very controversial topic because many observational studies have shown a direct dose response curve to the amount of artificial sweeteners somebody consumes and an increase in weight gain, abdominal adiposity, and an incidence of being overweight or obese. And these observational reports have been repeatedly sensationalized in the media which has been extremely convincing and confusing to a lot of people who hear about that. But this is something in the opposite camp believes to be called reverse causality, where the people who are seeking out zero calorie beverages are likely to be people who are also obese. So once they have already become obese, they tend to seek out drinks and foods that contain non-nutritive sweeteners. So that dose response curve seems to be directly correlated. But there is no current experimental literature to my knowledge that associates the use of artificial sweeteners directly with causing weight gain that is not just an observational study. An interesting study published in 2012 by Tate et al. was an original experimental study that actually showed non-caloric beverages as effective as water at inducing weight loss when swapped with regular soda. And on the note of increasing appetite, there was a study that refuted this in 2010 by Anton et al. where they had groups consuming a preload meal, one containing just regular sugar, and then another group consuming a preload meal made with non-nutritive sweeteners, which I believe was a blend of 
of stevia and aspartame. And this study showed that the group that had the artificially sweetened meal did not compensate later in the day or display any increase in appetite. My personal opinion is that there is a hard truth to the fact that many people might be affected behaviorally as a result of consuming artificial sweeteners. And this is with the mentality that after they have something sweetened with artificial sweeteners, they justify eating something that is more calorically dense later in the day that was justified by their zero calorie beverages throughout the day, causing inherent overeating. And this is not a direct result of artificial sweeteners making them do this. This is just dieters behavior. However, if more research comes out showing any form of mechanism that would explain an increase in weight as a result of consuming something that has no calories or energetic value, I'd be really interested to see some evidence to support that. And on another personal note, I do personally consume artificial sweeteners in moderation, of course, as I do with anything in life. And I personally feel that if you're healthy, you're active, and you incorporate a balanced diet, then you should have limited concerns consuming non-nutritive sweeteners. <sighs> So that is all I have for you for this video. That was a lot to go through and if you saw the amount of literature that I went through to narrow down as much as I did in this video, there is a ton of research on this topic and I just really wanted to give you the highlights and practical takeaways of all of this. And please, please, please let me know if you like this sort of content from me, more academic focused content. This video did take me a long time to prepare so if you guys like it, please let me know. And if you don't like it, also let me know. Let me know if you would have liked me to go Go a little bit deeper into individual studies. I do have all the studies linked down below as well as some studies that I didn't get a chance to go over as well as even some topics I didn't even get a chance to go over something like the association of aspartame and migraines for example that a lot of people are concerned about so I will link all of that below. If you are new please subscribe but wait don't click out of the video just yet. I'd like to send some love to the good folks over at Skillshare for supporting this video. They have continuously supported my channel so I'm extremely grateful to them and I'm also extremely grateful that I have sponsors to allow me to create this content for you guys full-time and if you don't already know Skillshare is an amazing online learning resource that I direct to anyone who is looking to start their own YouTube channel or thinking of jumping into the world of social media because they have over 17,000 courses all related to media cinematography photography things that help me as a content creator I will typically recommend two different courses that I think are perfect for getting started with video editing and Instagram photos. The first one is learning to edit using Final Cut Pro, which you know is the editing software I use to edit my videos. And the second is mobile photography basics for Instagram success for those who want to post amazing pictures just by using your cell phone. And membership started only $10 a month. However, Skillshare is kindly offering three months of unlimited access to all the courses for just 99 cents for the month of January. So hurry up and snap up this offer. It will be the first link in the description box below. So that's it for me. That is all I have for you. And I will see you in the next video. <laughs> Bye.